Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to this seminar on Ukraine's energy transition in a new political landscape that we caused here at NUPI today together with the Norwegian Ukrainian Chamber of Commerce. My name is Helge Blokkesru and I am the head of the research group on Russia, Asia and international trade at, here at the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs. 2019 has been an eventful uh, year in Ukrainian politics. In April, the U Ukrainian electorate turned their uh, back on the victor from the Euromaidan uh, revolution, Petro Poroshenko. Widespread dissatisfaction uh, with the powers that be uh, uh, resulted in an overwhelming uh, victory for the actor turned politician Volodymyr Zelensky. And in a sort of bizarre twist on fiction turning into reality, Zelensky, who has, had so far been best known uh, for playing the lead role as a teacher turned president in the Ukrainian TV series uh, Servant of the People, now repeated this feat uh, of this uh, fictional character. He used the momentum to call snap elections, as you know, uh, and in a further indication of widespread dissatisfaction uh, in the electorate uh, and the wish, of, uh, wish for change, people voted in an almost entirely new uh, cohort of politicians into uh, uh, the Rada. Uh, some 80% of the current members of the Ukrainian Rada are elected for the first time ever and have little or no experience from, uh, from politics at, at this level. Uh, a whole new cohort of uh, politicians are thus setting the agenda for Ukraine for the years uh, ahead and where to take Ukraine. And although Ukraine in recent weeks maybe have uh, uh, figured in international uh, headlines mostly in connection with the US politics and the possible impeachment of Donald Trump, today we are going to focus more on what's going on in Ukraine itself. Uh, we will have three presentations here today. Uh, the first will be uh, by uh, Anatoly Kriyuk from uh, the Norwegian-Ukrainian uh, Chamber of Commerce, who will focus on political developments uh, since the elections. It will be followed by Petr Nura uh, from Nur University, who will give us some uh, context of the uh, energy sector, uh, Ukrainian gas in uh, an international context. Uh, we saw some uh, interesting developments uh, uh, this week when it came to Nord Stream 2 and Denmark finally uh, allowing the construction of that pipeline, something which I guess we will return to in uh, Peter Nuri's presentation and implications for, for Ukraine. And then finally, uh, Norwegian-Ukrainian relations have uh, been developing rapidly in, in recent years. Uh, I think the uh, something that testifies to this is the opening of the direct flight between Oslo and Kiev uh, uh, last week. Um, and in the last presentation here today, uh, we will hear more of a practitioner's view, I guess, uh, from, from Norwegian-Ukrainian um, cooperation. Uh, and uh, Ilyas um, Anbar, uh, from uh, Scotex Solar will uh, give us some insights into Norwegian investment into the Ukrainian energy sector. Uh, th the seminar here today will be streamed online uh, uh, as uh, always here at NUPI. So uh, you will also have the chance to, um, to look at the presentations at the NUPI's YouTube channel after the seminar, and I'd also uh, like to welcome all who follow this seminar online right now. But without further ado, I'd like to give the floor to uh, Roman Bakulchuk from NUPE, who will chair this seminar today. Welcome. Um, thank you, Helge. Um, thank you, uh, everyone, for coming once again. Uh, it's our pleasure to welcome Mr. Anatoly Kiriluk, as Helge mentioned. Uh, for the first 15-minute uh, uh, presentation that will be uh, devoted to the uh, 
political landscape in Ukraine after the elections. Anatoly, please. Yes. Uh, thank you, Roman, for the introduction, and uh, thank you, Nupi, for cooperation. We appreciate it very much. Uh, this is already actually the second time during the last five months when we opened this floor at Nupi to uh, discuss what is happening in Ukraine. And it is because indeed a lot is happening in Ukraine since uh, Volodymyr Zelensky decided to uh, enter politics. He uh, changed the political landscape in Ukraine dramatically. We used to see him in Ukraine for the last 20 years uh, on the TV screens as comedian and actor and manager of the one of the biggest uh, film production uh, groups. We used to see him smiling all those 20 years. He doesn't smile that much uh, since he became the president uh, for the last five months, though he has all the reasons still to be smiling because uh, at the presidential elections he got 73% of the votes in the second round and one of his first decisions was to uh, resolve the current parliament and he had all the reasons for that. And uh, already in July uh, when the new election when the results uh, on the new election uh, were known, it became clear that he repeated uh, his success on the, uh, for the parliament elections or even done it even better to get 254 seats in the Rada out of 424. But then it should be, uh, when the truth should be said that he didn't get more than half of the votes in Ukraine on the parliamentary election. But this is due to the complicated election system in Ukraine, uh, which is called mixed system, where half of the parliament is elected according to the party list and half of the parliament is elected according to the single seat constituencies. And ironically enough, uh, when former president Petro Poroshenko was elected in 2014, one of his key promises was that he was going to <coughs> change the election system and eliminate the single seat constituencies. He, with the five years in power, he didn't have enough time to do so, uh, basically because he was hoping to, uh, for his political power to get re-elected with that single seat constituency systems. Uh, it's uh, basically how he came into politics in 1908, uh, 1998. Uh, but as we can see, he got only uh, two seats uh, with the single seat constituencies and servant of the people got 130 seats, uh, which gave Zelensky the power in the parliament, um, which puts him into a position when he doesn't really need to cooperate with any other political power to uh, make the decision go through. Uh, some other key numbers, uh, as Helge mentioned, 80% of the parliament are uh, new people. Uh, then also the number of female representatives increased also to 25%, which is a record for the Ukrainian Rada. Uh, compared to the <coughs> previous, uh, previous Rada, it was uh, 12 and a half percent. Our <coughs> parliament became much younger, uh, actually seven years younger. The average ye uh, age for the parliament members is 41 years old. Uh, then we got a new cabinet of ministers. And of course, when uh, people were voting for uh, new people, uh, both uh, in the, uh, for, for the Rada, they had uh, high expectations and some uh, people even started calling the new cabinet of ministers for cabinet of high expectations and of course they have to uh, work hard to live up to those uh, expectations. Just to, to, may, uh, to mention some of the key changes uh, in the previous uh, government we had 25 ministers now they're trying to uh, create better workflow between the ministers and uh, downsize the number of ministers to uh, 17 and combine some of the ministers, for instance, the Ministry of uh, Ecology and Ministry of Energy is now one minister. Uh, 
the average year for the cabinet of ministers is uh, even less. It's uh, 39 years old. And the reason for me focusing uh, that much uh, is because there was always talk in Ukraine about the generation change uh, and the generation change in the political elite. And now um, many people hope that this uh, happened. And just to uh, give you one of the examples, uh, 34 years old Dmitry Dubilet, who who is now the um, minister of the cabinet of the ministers, who is responsible for uh, uh, workflow between all the ministers in the cabinet. He entered the politics uh, from private sector, where he was responsible for digitalization of the uh, bank system. Uh, now he is uh, working on uh, making all the document flow between the ministers uh, electronic uh, by the end of this year. Uh, when he entered his office, he was shocked about the size of his room, uh, of, the, of his uh, personal cabinet, because he used to work in open spaces. So the first decision he made was to create an open space of his uh, room and then calculated that if ministers move into <coughs> one uh, or s several buildings, they can free up to 1,000 office places in the center of Kyiv, which is very much needed now. And now they are also working with that idea. Of course, when uh, all the ministers were appointed by the servant of, servant of the people, which also makes the situation when uh, Zelensky has control of both legislative and executive branches uh, of power. And it helps, of course, to, to make the decision go faster. Now we also know whom to blame, uh, because in, if the former government always had uh, to, to blame on someone, then they don't want to make the decision. Now they have all the power. And just to illustrate uh, one of the uh, first decisions that could have also been done by the former government, but happens first now, is this road, uh, which is uh, quite a good symbol, I, I, I find, when the former government uh, used three years to rebuild 70 kilometers of the road between Zaporizhia and Mariupol, which was absolutely uh, destroyed for years. Uh, and the new government, when they came, they decided to finish it and uh, build 130 kilometers in uh, a little bit more than two months, even though the plan of, for, of the former government was to finish it in 2022. So you see that if they want, they, they can make it. Uh, but it's not, not, of course, about only about the road. I mean, uh, the election laws that I mentioned, uh, now the decision is uh, made that uh, single-seat constituencies will be eliminated. Entire corruption court opened the court that so, uh, so many experts were uh, expecting and waiting for. Uh, then eliminating immunity of the m members of the parliament, uh, so many political uh, forces promised to do so from 2000, but first, now it is became the reality. Our new uh, Prime Minister Alexei Honcheruk uh, presented a document, uh, 118 uh, pages uh, plan for the next uh, five years. Uh, when you look through the document, you find at least I found two things that I liked a lot. The first one is that uh, they are not changing any course. Uh, they are still uh, focused on uh, uh, getting better relations with the European Union institutions. They are working on the building infrastructure, uh, economy, healthcare, and education. That's what previous government was working uh, with. And another thing which I liked a lot is that they have concrete numbers. They have registered uh, what is the situation uh, in different sectors as of today and what they expect it to be in five years. Uh, this is compared to the previous government which was, uh, which was always talking that we will make it higher, bigger, wider or deeper. But when you don't have numbers, you have nothing to ask them at the end of the day. So I found these uh, two things very important uh, in that plan. Um, 
three things that we in the Chamber of Commerce find very important for us to focus on is um, which uh, Honcharuk promises. 40% uh, growth of uh, GDP in five years, uh, 50 billion international investments, uh, very optimistic uh, compared to the previous year, uh, Ukraine got 2.5 billion uh, international investments, 1 million new workplaces. Then you ask, of course, the question how they are going to reach uh, all those uh, numbers. And the first, um, uh, they presented several in, uh, instruments in that document. One of them is uh, privatization. Uh, of course, there are states when the, uh, when the government and state can be a good manager, but unfortunately in Ukraine we have a very negative and long uh, track record when the government is not a good manager. And now, uh, a few days ago, the office of the president presented uh, first 500 uh, enterprises uh, that are in state ownership that are going to be privatized. And I, I find it very, very good because I don't know how many of you visited Ukraine if you lived, for example, in uh, Hotel Dnipro, which is situated right in the center of Kyiv, but is uh, almost, almost like traveling in a time machine back to the USSR. Uh, concessions, um, this is another instrument that is used very much in the European Union, but uh, in Ukraine it didn't work because uh, the investors were looking for changes when the, legis uh, when the um, disputes can be resolved not in the Ukrainian uh, courts, but in the international courts. These uh, amendments were done now and now uh, the first two objects, uh, the port in uh, Kherson and uh, Mykolaiv will put on to into a concession procedure and uh, the idea is that investors uh, will get guarantees by the state that they will uh, receive the money they invest into the object uh, back and er earn a certain am amount of money but at the end of the contract for this uh, Kherson uh, port, uh, there is 30 years contract, uh, it will come back into state ownership and management. Energy efficiency, building infrastructure, uh, the plan is to uh, build uh, 24,000 kilometers of uh, roads in Ukraine. I know if I, if I were to name one thing which is bad in Ukraine, I would say roads, because when you drive for half an hour, I get even more steps on my smartwatch, then I go from Groneloka to, to our central office, and then land market. Um, Tom Cruise visited Kyiv and Lviv a month ago, looking for new locations to uh, shoot films uh, for uh, film production. And by the way, the parliament uh, made the amendments uh, to the law, which uh, so many people were also in the film production sector were waiting for, uh, that the companies who shoot films in Ukraine, they can uh, uh, ask for tax refunds. And uh, this is very good for the creative industry because uh, more investments uh, would be expected in that sector. But coming back to the numbers which uh, Honcharuk presented, 50 billion US dollars in five years, it sounds uh, really uh, like mission impossible if Ukraine does not create the rule of law and not the selective justice. I think this is pretty much what I get in 10-15 uh, minutes, but uh, we will have the discussion after all. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Anatoly, uh, for a very interesting presentation. I'm sure many of us have got some questions for you to ask, but uh, please keep them for the Q&A session. Well, we will take them all. Uh, and uh, I think also great that uh, Anatoly has nicely uh, set the sort of the background and the context for the further discussion. And the next speaker today, as also Helge mentioned, is Petr Nure, professor at the North University and also senior consultant at uh, NORAD also former Chief Energy Advisor at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The floor is yours, thank you. Can you switch 
Is it on or shall I? Is it on? Fine. Thanks. Fine, okay. Thank you for uh, being invited. Um, it's a fascinating topic. Um, touches on all the interesting things that are related to gas in the Ukraine. And uh, so I will then start with simply reminding you of transit pipelines in, Euro in uh, Ukraine. Thank you. <coughs> Which is what this Tripatriot Commission is all about. Um, Let's uh, remind ourselves of a few things when we come to uh, transition, transit. It started, it was the first place for international transit of Russian gas to Western Europe in 1970, about 4 BCM. And it has been steadily increasing since. Today it has a capacity of around 140 BCM. Last year, Gazprom shipped 79 BCM, but as we all know, and I'll come back to that, how much will go through the network after a new deal is there is very difficult to say. Let me also mention that until 2015, all the um, gas that was sold from Russia to Ukraine for domestic consumption went through part of this network. Uh, after that, the Ukrainians are boasting that they don't take gas from Russia anymore, but of course they do. They just do it in the reverse flow, and they get it from the West through Slovakia and a number of other countries. But anyway, so uh, today we will concentrate, as I said, on uh, this transit and the conditions for that discussion. All the things that have been said so far is uh, uh, on this short list. Let me also mention that the existing transport, transport agreements uh, expire on the 1st of January. That's why this tripatriot negotiations actually take place. Okay, key elements in the transit negotiations. One, volume. Two, length of contract tariffs. Three, reforms of the EU, of the Uri uh, Ukrainian gas sector. Let's start with the first one. Volume, how much will be shipped through this system? Of course, it's a difficult question, and it depends on the number of variables. But let's first do the overall <coughs> outlook for Russian gas. And I would say, all in all, it's a negative market outlook for Russian gas. Which means, when you think about it, less transit. But uh, let's see whether, what lies behind such a view. Strong competition from LNG in the European market. If you look at what has happened during the last year, it's a formidable market development especially North American LNG, has come into Europe. It has slashed prices from $8 per million BTU to down to $3 per million BTU. And it's really, the Americans are willing to push gas into Europe at marginal costs, 
which means that they are increasing market shares all the time. Okay? So on the whole, that's what affects the Russian share of the market, negative. The overall size of the market is also negative. EU's decarbonization plans will reduce demand for all gas, Russian, Norwegian, Algerian, and LNG. But the pie becomes smaller, and the Russian part of that pie becomes smaller. That's a negative thing. So just have that in the back of your mind. But counterbalanced by this, there are some positive things for the Russians as well. Lower European gas production, which means that even if you have a flat, it's the only part of the world where you have a flat demand curve for natural gas, by the way. So even if it's flat, it can be positive for the exporters because the domestic uh, consumption uh, production is going down. And also, and here the Russians always come back to this, they have spare, lots of spare capacity in the Yamal at very low costs. So they say the picture is not so bad, but it's possible to argue that it is pretty bad, which means low outcome if you are a cynical analysis about what will happen for the future. Okay? Now, let's go to Russia's gas pipeline ties to Europe. Okay? Go and look at the green thing, which nobody talks about. It's the Turkish pipe. It will be finished by the end of the year, and it will be commissioned in the beginning of next year. And people say, ah, who cares? It's 31 BCM in capacity. Nord Stream 2 is 55. We are talking about a very important part of the game. And so, and that goes under the radar. And if you look at the third line going through Ukraine, going down south towards Romania and the Balkans, that transit line will be substituted by Turkic stream and reverse flow, which means that you attack that market from the south, which means that basically there will be suddenly 30 BCM being lost of the transit pipeline that goes through uh, uh, Ukraine today. So out of the 79, 30 might sort of disappear almost straight away. Uh, so just bear in mind, people never talk about Turkey Stream, but think about it. The blue one is the, the mother of all projects, North Stream 2. Okay? So I'll spend a little bit of time on that. Danish decision opens up for North Stream 2 startup in mid-2020. Basically, the Danes said you can cross over the continental shelf. No problem. You don't have to go around. You don't have to sneak around down that corridor. You just go straight. It's 147 kilometers. There are three, <coughs> three pipeline barges going at full speed at the moment. <coughs> they lay three kilometers each every day, so it's about 10 kilometers a day. So basically, in a, in a very short time, this project should make up the, this and take advantage of that decision. This has been officially a uh, decision about uh, uh, environmental issues. In reality, it has had the fair grain of geopolitics in it. Uh, so, but now people seem to have said, fine, we have achieved one thing and we have postponed uh, the startup of this until 2020, so at least you have to have some serious negotiations from in, uh, during in the transit. Uh, if anybody wants to come back to the Danish thing, please do so. Okay. Geopolitics. How solid, what, how could geopolitics influence the transit agreements and Nord Stream 2? I, in many ways, I would say that the, that the if, if you are a conventional thinker anyway, it's game, set, and match. Uh, Nord Stream 2 will be finished, and that's all there is to that. However, we live in a geopolitical world. Number one, what does the U.S. do? And nobody really knows what the U.S. does. Uh, they are 
putting forward the idea of energy hegemony in the world, and then people fasten their seatbelts and think, what is this? And then when you hear the rhetoric of all Americans about Nord Stream 2, you think that they are just about to drop something on that uh, project. However, in August last year, Congress actually went for a law saying full sanctions on Nord Stream 2. What has happened? Nothing. Trump has not actually pushed that nuclear button, and the question is why? And here we can discuss, but this is, maybe it's just an expression of the uncertainty of, of, of Russian uh, uh, way of, of doing geopolitics these days. But anyway, if he pushes that, something will happen. It might not stop it, but it will put a hand grenade into the project. Okay? I'm not saying it will stop it. It will just, there will be some consequences anyway. Russia, it's a big discussion. We don't need to go into that one. Energy part of the foreign policy toolbox. End of story. But in the present day, there's one thing that is very much on Putin, Gazprom's mind, and that is we are in for a pretty rough market perspective. As I was saying, the decarbonization of the EU will have serious consequences for everybody who actually produces gas into that market. So, they don't want a full-fledged gas war as you saw in 2006 and 2009. Rule that out. However, and this came up in the tripatriot discussions yesterday, they tried to put the Stockholm Arbitration Awards into these negotiations by saying, okay, we must do a full package. We want to do the, the, the politics and the economics and the commercial things at the same time. So that came out, that was leaked from the discussions yesterday. I, I just read it, so it's not here. But uh, bear that in mind. So Stockholm might actually sort of hover over all of this. Germany, oops, a commercial project, that's what they are saying. But last week there was a phone call between Putin and Merkel where Putin said, yes, I understand you're worried, okay? Ukraine is about to lose 3% of its GDP. We understand that's not, it's not in the interest of stability one way or the other. We will promise to actually book some long-term deals going through the Ukraine, okay? That he says, he's the good cop. Bad cop is Miller in the discussions yesterday, who stormed out of the meeting and said, it has to include Stockholm, Arbit. It has to be part of the solution. And nobody else, of course, thought that was a very good idea. But it just shows that also the Russians have, maybe it's a good bargaining kind of situation, but it's also, again, that they might not be totally aligned as far as this is concerned. Uh, so what does that lead us with? Okay, if you take that Gazprom will prevail and Nord Stream 2 will be built, and uh, Turkey Stream will come, and you have a long-term uncertainty about gas volumes. Pirani from Oxford Institute says, okay, 30 BCM through one of the three corridors, that's what you'll get as volume. Unsubstantiated figures, it's actually Sevkovic, who was EU's representative in the negotiations yesterday, he went on, on the record saying it has to be between 50 and 60. Okay? Who knows? And he said, I also want it over 10 years. So that brings us to our next one. Length of contract, transportation, tariffs, and other normal negotiating items. Okay? Opposite interest in setting transportation tariffs. Okay? Of course, the Ukrainians want it high, the Russians want it low, and the EU want it just like everybody else in Europe. Okay? Um, the Russians say Nord Stream 2 is 20% cheaper per unit of energy to transport than, um, than uh, even a refurbished uh, transit through the Ukraine. So there are good reasons to sort of follow, and it's an argument for actually 
pushing less uh, uh, volumes through. Uh, you, Ukraine wants 10 years. EU wants 10 years. <coughs> Russia doesn't want, they don't, they basically don't want this deal and they certainly want it as short as possible so that they are less d uh, that uh, the EU can, can't come back to them after five years and say, come on, you are breaking this rule because they don't have an interest in that. I think genuinely that they have understood that they have to make some kind of cooperation with the EU. And the uh, EU, as I said, wants the new contract to be in line with the energy package. The there is one element more, which is uh, on which is on the table, which is U Ukrainian reforms of the gas sector. Now, unbundling and transmission system operators, the TSO. Let's take unbundling first. That's a big issue in Ukraine. It seems to have found some kind of a compromise between. Uh, ownership and bundling and ICO, independent system operator bundling. So I think this is in the process of actually being solved. This is important because it's part and parcel of the third uh, EU's third energy package. And unless you get this thing going, the EU will never support you in the negotiations uh, or in the middle of. So that's uh, unbundling. And the transmission system operators, if some of you remember, this was there was a lot of talk about half a year ago about you know having a Western TSO actually to to guarantee that everything was fine. That has somewhat disappeared, and no, there is an MGU which is a, a, a kind of continuation of as, as a subsidiary of trans uh, of uh, Neftogas, uh, a transportation uh, company. The important thing about this. And this, I, I think this is moving in the right direction, but you never know. Uh, the independence of uh, the system operator from Naftogas has to be absolute, and the independent regulator must also be in space, uh, must also be in place. Yes. Key takeaways, sorry. On the case of North Sea, would that be unbuttoned? Let's come back to that. Key takeaways, transit negotiations raise three interesting issues. Volumes, and I think Nord Stream 2 is a foregone conclusion, but you never know about the geopolitics of it, so keep an open mind. But uh, uh, Turkey Stream certainly is there. Length of contract and tariffs, and you, a, a Ukrainian gas reform. These are three interrelated issues that come up, and you have to address, and you have to understand. And uh, so if any of you want to come back to any of these, I think the volume one is, is the most basic one. Uh, a future gas conflict between Ukraine and Russia is unlikely. These three parties have, after all, an interest in not making this blow up. So what you see now is a fairly standard negotiating disagreement between three parties. It's, it, of course, it's, it's more serious than that. This is not like any... Tom, Dick, and Harry kind of gas discussion. But it is, it has to do about some basic things that all gas the discussions actually go through. And since I've been negotiating gas contracts for 30 years of my life, I'm, I basically should know what I'm talking about. Uh, but maybe you don't have a contract by January 1st, but you might have a basic understanding. Uncertainties, never underestimate what Trump can do. He will not stop this, but it can actually make a lot of noise if he plays his card. I think it's too late now. I, I really think if he tried to hide behind Denmark, but uh, the Danes actually decided enough was enough. And no, uh, I think this will be completed. The geopolitics, as I said, of the US and uh, Russia is an important thing which you still should uh, think about as, as an uncertainty. Uh, the market outlook for gas in Europe as a, as a decarbonized uh, energy system is a long-term thing. <laughs> and domestic dynamics in the Ukraine can also upset. Let's assume that 
some of the negotiators come back with 30 BCM, I'm sure that lots of people in Ukraine will not be amused by such a figure. Uh, and then, last but not least, all of these contracts consist of a myriad of small, single things that none of you think are very important, but which actually are to actually settle a final deal. So those can go wrong. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, but for your very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, we know that the energy sector is uh, very vital for, for Ukraine, for Ukraine's uh, economy. Um, and, of course, natural gas transit and natural gas in general have been uh, very important. But no, also what we see is that uh, Ukraine is uh, slowly but surely is becoming also part of the global energy transition, showing more interest in renewable energy. And today we have a pleasure of uh, inviting to our uh, podium uh, Ijaz Anwar, who is the project development manager at the Norwegian uh, uh, firm uh, Skatec Solar, with a uh, couple of years of uh, actually uh, practical work in Ukraine and also investment in Ukraine. Uh, Ijaz, please uh, take the uh, floor. And uh, just a few words about Ijaz. He has been working in the uh, areas of renewable and environmental uh, developments in Ukraine, Pakistan, Nepal, and Bangladesh. Uh, also has a background in law, and we very much welcome your opinion on what's happening with the Ukrainian's renewable energy sector. Thank you for the introduction, and uh, thank you for inviting for this talk. I just went home yesterday, and my kids were waiting at Teban Station, asking me to buy Halloween costume. So then I went back, opened the computer, and checked what is the dress code for today's presentation. Luckily, it was not Halloween. <laughs> So uh, I work for Skatik Solar. Most of you probably know about Skatik Solar already, but I will just give a brief introduction what we do and where we do. Uh, we are an independent power producer. We develop, construct, finance, own, and operate solar power plants across the globe. Can you just move to the next slide? Oh, sorry. I don't have that. Uh <laughs> So we start project development from origination and take it to the very end, to the ownership. We finance, construct, operate, and maintain solar power plants across the globe. We have a big portfolio where we have 1.9 gigawatt of uh, solar PV projects in construction or in operation phase. More than one gigawatt is in operation and rest is, uh, is under construction, including a big portfolio in Ukraine. We have a backlog and pipeline of more than five gigawatts. Backlog, we say, when we are 80% certain this, that this project will materialize, that we put into backlog, and which the project which has more than 50% of likelihood of success, that is the pipeline. We now have around 320 employees across the globe, and we have 15 countries where we have our presence across four continents. <coughs> So our growth target is that by 2021, we aim to have 4.5 gigawatts of installed capacity, which means in operation or in construction, and thereafter 1.5 gigawatt every year from 2022. To meet that target, here is a sketch of where our current ba backlog and pipeline is in all four continents, Europe, Latin America, Africa, and Southeast Asia <coughs> is where ma our major hubs are, and as well as our portfolio is. This is a, these are some pics about of our operational and under construction assets. As you see, Egypt is our biggest hub, which where we have recently completed 390 megawatts of solar PV with a very new technology that is bifacial trackers meaning thereby that tracker would absorb elect, uh, solar light from both sides, from the top and reflected light from the down side. We also have around 200 megawatts in operation in Malaysia, same in South Africa, a big project, one single site project of 162 megawatts in Brazil, where we have Equinor as our partner. Honduras, we have 95 megawatts. Ukraine, we uh, 
achieved our first commercial op uh, operation date uh, operations for one of our projects in uh, southern part of Ukraine, 47 megawatts. We have uh, operational assets in Jordan, Mozambique, Czech Republic, and Rwanda. As I said, our biggest portfolio at under construction is in Ukraine, which comprises four projects under construction. Uh, South Africa is also uh, the second one where we have uh, additional three, mega, uh, three projects of around 86 megawatts each in construction in Argentina and then Malaysia. In Ukraine, we started our journey in Ukraine in early 2017, uh, and I remember that first meeting on Ukraine uh, took place in Petr Nure's office uh, I at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, where we had some insight on the energy market, especially on renewables from a renowned lawyer from Clifford Chance. Then uh, the journey started from there, and the first financial uh, advisor or lender's input we got was from NEFCO. Uh, Amun is sitting here. He was one of the first uh, persons from the lender side whom we contacted to get uh, the, in the insight into the market. So then after some spade work, uh, into in August our management visited the country after having um, uh, seen the progress uh, in on the legis legislation side. We signed our first project, an LOI, in October. Then in May it has been, f since then it has been a very rapid growth both in terms of the portfolio and in terms of uh, <coughs> uh, the employees and the, uh, the office we established there. We established an office in May. We took over shares in one first two projects in June, one of which is in operation now, and uh, the other one is close to completion. Then continuing thereon, we achieved our first financial close for two of our projects, the same 80 megawatt in December last year. And now in June then, we also achieved financial close uh, for another three projects, one of which is also financed by the very good NEFCO. <laughs> <laughs> then now we have, we achieved our first oper commercial operations in August. This is, this is how our portfolio looks. We have 100% stake in three uh, under construction projects, uh, two under construction and one under development project. 60% into uh, under construction projects and 51% in one of our operational assets. Yeah, so far we have been able to raise 4.7 billion NOC of capex, out of which 2.3 billion NOC is project finance. Rest is equity raised from our uh, from all our own shareholders. So as you can see, there is a long spread of uh, different banks which we have been able to uh, pull into our projects. First of our project was uh, financed by EBRD and BSTDB. In second, we were able to loop in FMO as well, who is also B lender here as well as uh, an equity partner. Then in third project, we had EBRD, NEFCO, and a new uh, bank entering uh, Ukraine, Swed Fund, it's a s Swedish fund. In third project, we also had FMO as leader, but then GIEC and G Green for Growth Fund added. And then in fourth project, uh, we have construction finance from Power China. And there are some reasons to that why we were not able to pull in uh, DFIs in that transactions. We I'll come to that later. These are some visuals of our uh, under construction and operational assets uh, in Ukraine. So Ukraine has been a very interesting market for us. We have seen a rapid growth, not just for us, but other uh, competitors of ours entered into market and uh, have been able to uh, have developed some projects. But the Ukraine ha is attractive market in many respects. It is opening up for future investments. It's coming closer to Europe. There is political will on in Europe as well to put more investments in to bring it. And then as mentioned by one of our speakers that uh, they are opening up uh, the energy market as well. Uh, so they had a green tariff which was very attractive uh, at the outset. 
investment was available. EBRD was one of the leading investors in Ukraine. Then we also had the uh, FMO, NEFCO, who is, uh, NEFCO was already uh, investing in renewables and more on uh, the, the development projects, infrastructure projects. And as you can see that in last three years, it, when we started, it was at r around 74 or 75 ranking in ease of doing business. It gradually improved in last two years. To, and in the recent report, it has gone up by six to 64. Mm. After having decided to enter, there were some happy surprises and there were some challenges which we saw. Coming to happy surprises that during this period from 2017 to up until now, there has been a lot of regulation has been eased on the financial uh, or banking side. Cur currency controls have been eased. Uh, repatriation regulations have been uh, made comfortable for the international investors. Registration of a different kind of shareholder loan agreements have been made easy. So that is the positive surprise. Also, we, we saw that, as you can see, we have in say less than a year, since uh, more than a year, since we have established our office, we have been able to have 75 uh, employees, at or the full-time employees. So there is a lot of human capital available there, competent people. So that was, uh, as compared to other markets we have been, that was a very happy surprise for us. On the challenges, grid is the most complicated uh, aspect of developing energy projects in, in Ukraine. <coughs> uh, and there are a lot of limitations, grid connection costs are very high, so this makes the project a bit expensive than compared to some other markets. And then, as some of you already mentioned uh, about the geopolitical situation, I was with uh, three lenders, their technical advisors, on two sites, uh, site visits for their technical due diligence the very day on which martial law was imposed. So that created a panic, but it, it didn't stop anything, but the process slowed a bit. So that has been a challenge all, uh, for all the investors, even for banks. They just took a position that, okay, we will wait and see for a month or so how things move. Luckily, martial law was lifted, and then the pr process moved ahead. Other biggest challenge in Ukraine has been, and I, I think it continues as such, is it's a country in change. And the regulation change at a very fast pace. So that brings two complications. One is that it, once a change happens in a regulation, the authorities or the, the departments which have to implement those um, changes are not trained enough or doesn't have the enough information to make that implementation. So there is a pause. For example, I gave the example of shareholders' loan e registration agreement, agreement registration. First, National Bank of Ukraine <coughs> was the authority who registered those. That requirement was removed, so made it easier to register. But there was a time lag between the implementation and actual implementation like one or two months where the servicing banks were not trained enough, were not bold enough to get those agreements registered. So on the one side, the change was positive, but then the implementation phase, the gray area between the ap implementation date and actual implementation was an area which needed improvement. The second challenge it brings is that legislations and regulations are interlinked. So while the authorities change one regulation, they forget to change the connected legislation. So for example, on environmental side, there are two legislation requiring the same environmental study. You have to do the same thing twice, but you have to get a totally separate approval processes. Because one legislation was introduced, not changing the other legislation. So that has been um, one of the challenging uh, areas as well. So uh, once again, thanks for inviting, and I'm, I'm open for any questions uh, when the question answer session opens. Thank you.
thank you very much, Ijaz and Petra, as well as Anatoly. Now I would like to welcome you to the podium for taking chairs uh, and continuing our discussion. So three uh, very uh, interesting and uh, thought-provoking presentations. So thank you once again to, for all speakers. And uh, I think we, uh, we would like to organize it as interactive as possible. Um, and of course, great if you could then think of your questions that you can ask. Uh, but uh, if you don't mind, also as a, as a chair, I would like just to take this opportunity or, and maybe set the discussion tone a bit. Because as you can see, uh, there has been some linkages between all three presentations. And the first, as Anatoly started uh, presenting the overall uh, political context as well as the reform context, uh, it was, uh, I think, great to learn about all these new developments. And then, uh, of I think it would be great, Anatoly, if you, can, uh, if you could comment a bit on the uh, where actually is energy in this whole reform process in Ukraine how much is on top of the agenda of the government and uh, we know that well there are many many issues and also many reform measures have been in initiated by the new government so in that regard do you think to what extent energy has been prioritized whether it gains enough attention or not <coughs> uh, also like how to deal with these challenges of that one has to work on many different reform uh, passes at the same time um, then I think it would be great also if you uh, better could also comment on the recent uh, developments uh, in Ukraine and also the implications that you uh, as a sort of the external observer could see uh, happening and what are the implications for the energy sector also including on the case of the uh, gas, uh, natural gas reform. So I mean here for example is there like a new staff, new people participating from the Ukrainian side also what have been the main implications so far. Um, and uh, I think then uh, also um, Ijaz if you could then uh, comment on the situation regarding the uh, the uh, well, renewable sector management in Ukraine in general. Also, if you have, uh, you've been in Ukraine for the last uh, couple of years, so you uh, probably can think of the differences uh, uh, that this new government has brought so far, or you haven't actually uh, noticed any big differences in terms of the management of the renewable energy sector. And after you, we make a round of comments, we will then proceed with your questions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, well, of course, I mean, like in, in most of the countries, energy is something that people don't even think about. They just put their mobile phone on the charger or put their coffee machine. Uh, but in Ukraine, uh, energy has been always a politicized question. <laughs> Therefore, of course, the energy will uh, be on the agenda of the current government and uh, but but to to look at the things like you started ma um, mentioning yes i i was very happy that uh, the new uh, cabinet of ministers started with uh, for example combining the ministry of environment and ministry of energy into one institution because it makes things go faster so they are of course uh, aware of that and uh, <laughs> Another thing when it comes to renewables, uh, we should put it into context that in 2012 only uh, less than 2% of the all energy produced in Ukraine uh, were coming from renewables. And now Ukraine has declared that uh, in 2035 we will have uh, 25%. Uh, it means that uh, the regulation and framework should be put in place if uh, the number of the uh, energy generated by the renewable actors is uh, increasing. And then the last thing which I think uh, always about um, coming, visiting uh, energy, especially gas and uh, oil forums in Ukraine, uh, which is very like uh, tra the traditional sector and um, <coughs> we should be honest that energy sector in Ukraine uh, used to be one of the most corrupted sectors in Ukraine. And uh, we could uh, remember the uh, situations when uh, very often the companies applying for the uh, license uh, or permission to 
uh, extract gas or oil in Ukraine, uh, we, we could see the situation when uh, the companies existing on the paper uh, were getting those permissions, but they had uh, not, no facilities uh, to extract gas, but they were interested to sell those permissions further to the companies that were actually uh, extracting gas. This is something that uh, should be changed, and I was very happy uh, to follow in these changes in Ukraine the last years, and I, I hope that we will see uh, more of the transparent tenders uh, where also international companies can participate and uh, win the things. And the last thing is also greed in Ukraine. Now we have also um, heard from the government that they are very much interested to put the greed also for the uh, international investors, uh, maybe on the concession uh, agreements and so on, uh, because greed is uh, something that uh, it's like a bottleneck in Ukraine for the energy for many projects and uh, I was happy that they are putting that uh, also on the agenda. Um, I think that <coughs> the new government is not working on anything that is new as such. I mean, you are still working on the same old important things like energy efficiency, you're working on, on the unbundling issue, you're working on the uh, tra uh, transport uh, operator, uh, you are working on reforming the electricity sector. <coughs> so from that point of view, I see nothing that hasn't been there before <coughs> that that really is, is what they are interested in. Or So the point is, and the real thing is, do they make a difference in carrying out the policies that actually you have identified. And, and that's, that's, that's the big thing. And, uh, and the answer is yes, but it's early days. And uh, I will not be that sort of say that, you know, the world has transformed itself. I mean, as somebody said, you, you don't one day sort of elect somebody else, some, a new person, and then next day you, you wake up in Germany. I mean, they, they, things don't happen like that. <laughs> so, so I mean, you, you, so, so let's let's give this thing some time, and and uh, but I I think that there are lots of important and good kind of uh, directions and and uh, tidbits of, of information that's coming out, which and I think taking taking uh, corruption seriously is is something that you know it, it it probably is the mother of everything so but again you know it's gonna take 10 years so so that's that's my first uh, sort of observation the second one is maybe in what I was talking about the sort of highly politicized global politics of transit agreement through the Ukraine and Nord Stream 2. I mean, because this is what we are talking about. No, we are not talking about sort of small little things, I mean, or incremental change. No, we are talking about the big thing. And I, I feel that from a geopolitical point of view, I think that the way that the new administration is approaching the whole question of war and peace will have some kind of a spillover effects on what actually is happening in the negotiations between the Ukrainians and and the Russians in in the transit agreements. I I I cannot. I mean, I see that the sort of open. So th that's just my hunch, and and of course I don't have a proof of that. But take. I mean, things have changed. I mean, you know, Putin has committed to some kind of serious transit volumes. But of course, the devil is in the details. What will be the tariffs? What will be the sort of take or pay conditions? Uh, I mean, it, all the things that I talked about. But, but on the whole, maybe there is a little bit of a different tone on, on that mega level. But your, your question was more on the boring side, on energy efficiency and uh, things like that. And uh, <laughs> there, of course, I mean that the challenge is the same. It's still the most, the least efficient 
economy, energy-wise, in the whole world, period. And somebody has got to just seriously buckle down and do something about it. And uh, a and, and new president in itself, of course, will not make a difference. You need it? This does work. In, in <coughs> renewables, I don't see that there has been any substantial change since this new government took over. Actually, what this new government is doing is trying to implement the laws which have been passed or reforms which were made before they took over. For example, uh, the, the latest change in this uh, market was that they are opening up for auctions from starting from next year. But that law was not passed by this government. It was passed by the previous government with some sub-legislation or subordinate legislation work to be done by this government. So at the moment, they are doing that work, uh, bringing some regulations or uh, rules for uh, how the, the auctions will proceed. But as, as uh, Peter mentioned, that they are in the office, say, f president for six months or five months, and rather, say, two, three months. So uh, we will have to see yet what and how <coughs> they proceed in future. At the moment, they are just trying to implement whatever uh, the previous RADA or the presidential uh, uh, cabinet had uh, had approved. Uh, we'll see how, how the markets move, how the market moves in future. But so far, there hasn't been any substantial change uh, seen in the last four or five months. Yeah, I think we can conclude that there has been uh, quite a notable um, pragmatic succession in many areas especially related to the energy sector in Ukraine. Now we are ready to take questions from the floor, and I think you are first. Thank you. Could you please introduce yourself? Karen Slim, Slim Energy. Ten years ago, I was on the board. Yeah. Yeah. Karen Slim, Slim Energy. Ten years ago, I was on the board of an oil company wanting to produce oil and gas in Ukraine. So they have improved some things because it was regulatory, a nightmare. Mm -hmm. I'm inspired by young Jakub, who has written a book on how Nordics can learn from lessons, sorry, lessons from Ukraine. And there are several things. And I think one of the most interesting and important ones to learn, which is at the core of what we're talking about here, is if and when demand falls, pipelines have a problem. Europe keeps building new pipelines, and some will be not full. Pipelines are made for being full baseload. Remember that in the 90s, Bukhard Bergman, who was head of Rogas, bought a few shares in Gazprom. He and Vyakarev agreed that a direct route to Germany was best. So. People are now talking about Nord Stream 2 as a new route. It's not a new route. It's a doubling of the existing capacity of an existing route, mainly because Germany and Russia did not trust the Ukraine. The Ukraine is in the middle of two very different regimes, and they are at war with one of them, <laughs> very little mentioned. So when I, last week, heard Simon P Pirani present his 30 BCM, together with both the Russian and um, Ukrainian counterpart, um, the numbers became uh, blurry. And the Ukrainian Naftogaz representative was saying, um, remember, these pipelines are part of our defense system. If no one in Russia needs them anymore, easier to bomb. Scary. Or that was an argument. And then she says, you in the EU, you have your rules for how to, to tariff pipelines. The flow is little, so even if we have cost reflective, which is what the EU wants them to have, the tariff becomes really, really high. The system was made for natural monopolies. It's not anymore. So when the first Nord Stream 2 Nord Stream was planned, Germany or the rest of the EU didn't really notice or care about it because they were thinking about themselves. Now they have members and friends <laughs> further east 
And I'm not surprised that Merkel wants to be kind to them and say, let's take a little bit through the Ukraine. <clears throat> but it is a challenge, what should tariffs be? It's also a challenge that still in the Ukraine, it's almost Soviet prices on households and other retail. So it's political in that they want to have uh, be nice to their voters. But if the import price already is higher than the retail price, and then you add uh, high tariffs, it's a problem. So basically, Naftogaz is saying we need money to run this pipeline. And you in the EU should be happy if we can <laughs> keep it going and we have all the storage and stuff. So they're selling their story. But it's very complex, but still, ha there's a process in the EU, which is also a lesson for some other countries, where they say, Kuvadis, we have had these principles for gas regulation. Are they still okay? And together with Oxford, um, we suggested something saying, one entry, one exit. It would be simpler, and then what do you do? What do investors do? And Naftogaz and, and the new un independent transmission company have a challenge in attracting foreign investment to something that is uh, looking a bit of a dog. Um, it's a losing business. And Yamal also has spare capacity, and they want to have gas from Norway. So this whole picture of designing a market for growth and then getting not growth and maybe even fall is very interesting and challenging. Just a one last point on, yes, they want to be greener in the EU, and they want to look at life cycle economics or life cycle emissions. So LNG from the US has a worse stamp than even Russian gas. Russian gas comes in two colors. The normal Gazprom one, which everyone thinks of as the Russian gas, or Novatech. Novatech sells LNG to Lithuania, US, UK, and several others. They're not as, they find ways around the sanctions. And it seems Putin is quite popular, quite happy with them challenging this thing, because Gazprom really never got off the ground on proper LNG sales. And these two can open different doors. So no clear question, but just trying to stimulate for more discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> I'm uh, Bjorn Saltvik. I'm running my own consultancy, Attention IS focusing on uh, business risk solutions. And I've just stayed uh, three years in Ukraine and um, giving advice to Norwegian investors and companies um, investing in, in the country. Uh, regarding uh, the renewable energy sector, the so-called green feed-in tariffs <coughs> are very good. And uh, I haven't heard it mentioned today, but I've read recently that uh, the new government in Ukraine thinks they are too good. They want to reduce the tariffs for the next 10 years. Could we have some uh, comments about the implications? And it also is, uh, can we say, a, a bigger question. Because if you cannot trust the guarantees, if you cannot trust agreements and promises, contracts, that raises a lot of questions about stability and foreseeable financial implications. Thank you. First. We'll take two more questions and then we'll proceed with the discussion. Hello, uh, Eric Stuart from Rival Capital. Um, I have a question to Anwar. Um, on your solar project in Ukraine, uh, did you develop uh, the project from scratch yourself? Uh, what is the land arrangement and what is the electricity selling price arrangements for those projects? And one question to Peta, what is happening with the unbundling on the Nord Stream 2 uh, pipeline? Because uh, this should not be owned by the Russian, the pipeline itself. So how do you resolve this? Uh, and one more question. 
I also don't have really a question, but an, an, an addition or uh, comment um, um, on another aspect of uh, um, Ukrainian Norwegian energy cooperation on, on reducing the carbon footprint of, from uh, Ukraine's uh, um, uh, gas operations, uh, Ukrainian um, uh, gas company Naftagas. Um, my name is Olga Sanzadar, um, I represent Carbon Limits, and we work uh, with Naftagas on reducing their um, emissions uh, from methane, and we actually have to thank Petra uh, Nora for starting this work, uh, the Norwegian-Ukrainian cooperation um, on uh, energy. Um, and we have worked uh, under the auspices of uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and then with Amund and uh, NAFCO, and now we are working um, uh, with EBRD, and actually working, now we have expanded, and we work now with uh, with the whole of NAFTA gas, um, so the Ukrainian gas production company, Ukurgas with the Bovania, um, the, um, the <coughs> trans gas, um, uh, you know, the, the operator, now the operator of the storage sites, and the new um, unbundled um, operator of, uh, of the line, the uh, pipelines. It's very interesting that we are actually going through the unbundling inside our team. We have a very small team inside Aftergas, and one of our colleagues is being unbundled. And uh, um, we can actually really see this happening from, uh, maybe it is happening. It's, it's, it's all in place, and it is happening from January 1st uh, operationally, and, yeah, and all procedures are being put in place. Um, so it's, it's, it's very interesting, and there's a lot of transfer of knowledge, and also we are learning a lot. We have covered maybe around 20% of NAFTA gas's infrastructure now on food, you know, with, uh, with equipment. Um, and we are learning and, uh, about how they operate, and, and they are learning from us, and uh, we hope to continue working together. And I just wanted to, s to thank you, uh, Petra and Amund, for supporting um, this work, and we just hope that it continues. Thank you very much. Uh, I think now we can uh, take the floor and uh, Petro or just you would like to start first. So uh, coming to, I think I will answer your second question and then it will also include uh, your question. So the current uh, arrangement for four or five of our projects we have uh, on the uh, price is around 15 uh, euro cents for a short-term PPA, like 9 to 10 years uh, power purchase agreement. So coupled with these two, it's for, for investor, it's not a very high return, um, as you were mentioning. So, and we are hearing those discussions, but as I mentioned in the uh, uh, question answer to uh, his question, that so far we haven't seen any new legislation being passed. There are being changes being discussed uh, in the direction you are uh, referring to, that they want to kind of find a balance where maybe they, they intend to reduce price but enhance the PPA term to a longer term so that the not r net return to the investor remains the same as it was when they decided to invest. So, but that nothing has been approved yet. It's all discussions going on, and we are also having skin in the game. As we are uh, heavily invested, we are looking into uh, very closely. But yes, the discussions are going on without any decision being made yet. Mm. On land, uh, we, we didn't, uh, in all these projects, we the least developed project we took over uh, was uh, the one which didn't have the grid connection agreement but still had the land, so we didn't develop the land ourselves uh, in any of these projects. It's, it's In all cases, it's a lease from the state. Thank you. I think the question of tariffs for renewables is very important, and everybody saw this thing coming. <laughs> Because it's, it's a classic thing. A government actually gives very generous terms to actually to get the first investors on the, on the hook. And then, uh, and then the point is, are, are you going to let a f number of companies basically get a nice p piece of uh, return? Or do you, how fast do you actually sort of tighten the terms? And I think uh, 
auctions after X number of years is fine. I mean, you got in with 450 megawatts uh, before they slammed on that door, as far as I can see. And uh, so I, I, think, uh, I think if they look at what happened in Spain when something similar happened, and the Spanish government actually retroactively changed the terms and paid a hell of a price for that in terms of lack of investments. There is a balancing act here, and I'm glad I'm not Minister of, of uh, Energy in, in Ukraine, having to balance this. <coughs> and then uh, the question on, on uh, Nord Stream 2 and the unbundling of Nord Stream 2. Uh, here is, is an interesting legal thing, because most of Nord Stream 2 is in international waters. They do the sort of um, third energy package apply in international waters? No, it doesn't. It don't. So you might. Uh, so basically, EU doesn't have a sort of. They cannot force any any kind of solution onto Nord Stream two. Uh, so, so this is terribly complicated. Once it gets into German territory, can they impose a different thing or, or different rules? And, and, you know, it becomes kind of special if you, after 900 kilometers, suddenly meet a, a sign saying you are entering Germany and here there are new rules for the unbundling. And then if you really want to sort of be speculative and, and find something interesting to talk about one late evening, it's will this be the perfect excuse for Russian government to actually take away the export monopoly of Gazprom and therefore open up that pipeline for other transporters. And uh, once you get a, a good Russian person who knows about the world going on that one, you don't stop him until in the morning. <laughs> but it's, 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 all I'm saying is it's a very interesting issue and of course I don't I, I cannot sort of give the answer I'll just tell you what what the discussion is so our previous round of questions was with long questions I think now we have time only for the round with very short questions I think we can allow for three questions from the audience and then a couple of short questions from me so uh, Arlt Uh, we heard about the unbundling, yeah, that it's going on in, in Ukraine, and you seem to be quite, quite optimistic about that also. But what about the technical uh, condition of the pipeline system in Ukraine? Do you have any view on, on, on what, is, what is the situation, what is required for in, in refurbishment? More questions? I saw someone here. When talking about uh, renewables in Ukraine, we have uh, looked into this uh, solar power, but uh, some years ago there was a lot of talk about uh, uh, biomass as a potential source of renewable energy in Ukraine. Uh, is something happening in this uh, sphere or is it kind of um, a dead end? My uh, question uh, is on wind. Um, uh, the Norwegian company NBT just announced a new mega project for wind with Chinese capital. Uh, is uh, I don't know whether any of you have an in insight into that, but is uh, that an indication that uh, Western capital is running out for capital for energy project in Ukraine, as they have to go to Chinese capital, and uh, is Chinese capital an issue, a problem in Ukraine? Uh, and very short questions from me. First question uh, to our first speaker, to Peter. Um, so you mentioned this uh, rising issue of de decarbonization in the European demand. So how would you comment on the, in terms of the, uh, if there's an increasing uh, decarbonization in the European Union, what would be the implications for Ukraine in the three to five to seven years time perspective? So just a question uh, to think about. A uh, question uh, regard, uh, to uh, Ijaz concerning the renewable uh, energy development. Uh, well, there was a recent global study that shows that actually the biggest problem for most of the countries in the world in terms of renewable energy development is actually the implementation side. 
So uh, more than 80% per of the countries have actually adopted the best practices in terms of the legislation, but they all struggle to actually implement it. So in your view, what are the sort of the low hanging fruits for Ukraine in order to have some very quick adjustments in order to have better implementation on the ground? And the question, the last question to Anatoly, we've seen recently some increasing interest from the different Norwegian energy actors, especially in the renewable energy area. So how do you see the <coughs> business cooperation in this area for the uh, years ahead, like for maybe the next two, three, five years? Uh, do you see that the cooperation will increase and in which particular areas? Thank you. Okay, thank you. I, I'm not aware of um, why NBT is going for uh, Chinese financing or I can't speak on their behalf as well. Mm -hmm. But in general, I think, as I mentioned, that the, the system is going towards auctions. So uh, I could guess that probably the lenders are waiting for that phase to start. Uh, but I can't speak anything else about uh, why they went for Chinese. Uh, on the best practices question, I think we are in countries, very challenging countries, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Rwanda, Mozambique. Me personally, I feel that Ukraine has been very good in implementing. And you can gauge it from the time it takes to develop a project and con finance and construct in Ukraine as compared to other markets. And we had a project, the first one which we achieved for commercial operation was, we took it over in May, 2000, June 2018, and it was operational in August 2019. So this is one gauge, how quick you can develop a project and implement. So if I think that Ukraine is a, in that regard, implementation of the laws or the renewable uh, policy is, is comparatively a better market than the others. Yeah, I think uh, there wasn't any question to me uh, except this. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, I can uh, comment on further points that I uh, wrote down. Um, the land, uh, you cannot uh, buy land in Ukraine. Uh, you can only lease it. Uh, they had started uh, discussions, negotiation about the opening the land market, but uh, I don't think that it will happen very uh, at, the, at the very uh, first stage. Uh, then Chinese capital, of course, uh, uh, it's not on the behalf of the NBT, but uh, there is a lot of Chinese capital in Ukraine already, and especially in the energy sector, and there is no restrictions for uh, foreign capital except there are some uh, restrictions for the Russian capital. They, uh, Ukraine does not want uh, Russia to invest in any uh, important uh, infrastructural ob objects in Ukraine, for instance. Uh, regarding the bioenergy, uh, Jakob, uh, it didn't uh, go that well uh, as uh, the wind and solar energy, simply because uh, it is uh, very costly, uh, but you get uh, very little energy. So the, the, uh, there are some pr small projects in Ukraine, but uh, it is much easier to uh, to build a 50 megawatt solar park than uh, to, to get the same amount of energy out of uh, biomass. But I think that in, in uh, taking the starting point that Ukraine has very good position for developing uh, biomass uh, energy as well. Uh, I think it will uh, come. And then uh, coming back to your question uh, regarding the investments, I think that Ukraine should, uh, of course, focus on its homework, first of all, by creating the transparent and fair conditions for all potential investors uh, and where rule of law is fundamental and judiciary system is uh, independent, uh, not only for the energy actors, but for all the investors, because if they want to uh, have uh, international players to come and to participate in privatization, concessions, and uh, greed repairment, uh, these things uh, should be first in place. Thank you. Uh, and Peter, please. Very quickly on the state of the transit system. Uh, first of all, there is no 
accepted text on what the state is. So this is an issue of, which has been really <laughs> embedded in the in the non-transparency part of the world because obviously this is a strategic in, uh, information and if the new government could actually just release what is there because there are there, at least I know about one uh, report which was done about three years ago which was just buried somewhere and, and nobody wanted to release it and people have different views on, on this so don't believe for a second any of the figures that you hear from anybody just wait for a sort of baseline that somebody has to come out with soon and uh, I think it, even the Ukrainians themselves have given up maintaining the southern line because they see that Turkey stream will actually eat up that one so so there are very clear uh, single instances where they have refused to replace uh, uh, equipment that would keep that alive so that's dead and so if you are then talking about are you going to maintain one or two the lines that depends on what volume you end up with in the transit agreement and uh, three uh, it goes back as I said during my talk to the tariffs the transportation tariffs EU lets into that transportation tariff a, a soft part go to refurbishment and new investments there of course the Ukrainians want high degree of, of extra for that EU has said that they are willing to actually give a very soft loan to Ukraine to actually do that so as everything else in the world is it's a combination of politics and commercial issues um, thank you very much Petra and everyone I think now we can start with a big applause to all our uh, speakers uh, it was a really great discussion to have you all here. I hope we'll meet again on a, another occasion soon to discuss some more new developments in the energy sector. Uh, I think now we can all proceed to the area uh, with coffee break uh, on the right side uh, of this audience, uh, on the left side from you. So, uh, and also one thing that uh, the issue of geopolitics and the energy transition, renewable energy was mentioned. Two weeks ago we just published a big study for the whole world, also that includes Ukraine, so you can see some of the um, uh, copies of that on, this, on the table behind you that you can uh, pick up for your use. So thank you once again and bye-bye. Uh, thank you. Thank you.